All right, uh, this is, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, today is uh, October 13th, 2021. This is a meeting of the full uh, Cannabis Board Advisory Committee and I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, I, uh, has everyone uh, had a chance, or at least the majority of people had a chance to look at the minutes from our prior meeting, which was on September 29th, 2021? Yes. Could I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, great. Any any discussion? Any changes, edits? No. Okay. Um, then uh, all in favor? Great. Okay, um, just a few administrative details. Uh, thank you all for kind of uh, doing this again, um, you know, two weeks after our last full advisory committee meeting and of course all the work in between. I think, um, you know, we as a board have been discussing uh, just, you know, the amount of time and effort uh, the advisory committee um, has had to put into this work and it's all been incredibly valuable input. But I think, um, you know, we want to move to a slightly different kind of phase of our work. And um, the way that, you know, I see this happening is a lot of our subcommittees are actually naturally kind of coming to a conclusion. Um, I think a lot of them will be winding down this Thursday and a few of them will meet um, next week as well. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll keep you posted on the final um, schedules for those. But our goal, I think at this point, will be to, for the board to have um, much longer meetings uh, moving forward and to have some decision points ready for you all to review at kind of uh, at a much kind of higher level, um, you know, before we have big milestones as a board. I'm thinking before we kind of have major reports due to the legislature and before we file our rules. Um, so uh, I think that that is um, the plan for moving forward. I've talked to a lot of you about that plan. I think uh, a lot, there's some support about that. Um, you know, we've done a lot of work to get to where we are today. And the point of today's meeting is to review our October 15th report, um, which is uh, our market structure report, our corresponding fee structure, and our social equity criteria. And I know that you know we're still working on what the benefits of the social equity program will be and we'll continue that work. Um, but I think we should look at the criteria today, which is due to the legislature on um, October 15th, uh, which is you know, on Friday. So Jen, I don't know if you're ready to get started um, with the kind of overview of the market structure um, and the fee structure, but uh, if you are, we'll turn it sure. over to you. And if you want us to pull anything up on our screen, just let us know. If you want to show the, um, if you want to show the, actually, let me check and see if I can screen share. Do I have permission to screen share? You do, yes. There should be um, on your screen, there should be a, uh, in the upper right hand corner, a uh, little, there you go. Okay. You got so it. So the fact that I'm doing that, I can't really see all of you, but. Uh, okay, so Jen, why don't you? As many of you sorry, why don't you walk this? through it, and then we'll pause for discussion, and then we'll do the social equity criteria, and then pause for discussion, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to walk through this very briefly because we don't have a lot of time. This is a 63-page document, which I think really um, goes into the fact that there's been a lot of work um, that has gone into this. Uh, as you know, the report is due obviously to the legislature on Friday. So um, in this report, you'll see the background requirements and process, the market analysis that was done, state licensing recommendations, state fee recommendations, the cost revenue and taxes, and the local fee recommendations. Um, I will tell you that when it comes to the market analysis, Andrew has done an amazing job. Um, I cannot explain like he can. I know that when the subcommittee, when we had conversations, he did a miraculous job at that. So if there's any, um, 
So for the background requirements and process, uh, there is the board, the advisory committee, the subcommittees, the consultants, the relevant requirements, the fee report, and the public comment. Um, as you know, the Cannabis Control Board, you have the chair, Mr. Pepper, Mr. Harris, and Ms. Halbert. And if I'm going over things you already know, feel free to tell me to, to speed up. Um, the advisory committee members are here in which statutory position that they each hold. The various subcommittees, uh, the advisory subcommittees, compliance and enforcement, public health, market structure, social equity, medical cannabis, and sustainability. And the consultants was the National Association of Cannabis Businesses. I saw Gina, I can't see anybody now. I'm not sure if anybody else from NACD is on. And then you have the team from BS Strategies. So the relevant requirements of the report, um, Act 62, Section 4A states that the Co Cannabis Control Board shall provide recommendations to the legislature um, and that state fees be charged and collected uh, and that they should be projected to be sufficient to fund the duties of the Cannabis Control Board. And they should include amount to repay over a period of not greater than 10 years, the general fund, any uh, money that it was essentially sent to the regulation fund. Um, so this is the statutory requirement which we were all working from from the get-go. I have to commend uh, the state of Vermont and Canada's control board because the, the emphasis on public comment has been great. Um, time was reserved at all public, at all board meetings, advisory committee meetings, and subcommittee meetings for public comment. Uh, since the end of May, there have been 16 full board meetings, two advisory committee meetings, and 50 subcommittee meetings. Um, and that there has been over a hundred substantive comments received to the board to date. Now, can people still submit comments or is that part over? No, people can still submit comments and there's a robust okay. public comment period throughout the rulemaking process. So the market analysis, um, I have to say, was done by Andrew Livingston, who is part of our BS team in Colorado. It was to show the supply and demand model determining the cannabis demand, evaluating the supply, and then looking at the total supply and demand, the total cultivation required to meet that demand and projected sales. Um, so as an overview, we developed a market analysis to do just that, determine both annual and seasonal cannabis demand. I think the important piece of this is that um, there has been an emphasis on outdoor cultivation, which ultimately um, would, reside, would result in seasonal demands. Um, evaluate the total square feet of cultivation in product production volume required to meet that demand, and then project both indoor and outdoor production um, timelines so that you can understand the seasonal trends in supply and demand. So as you can see, and it's very well color coded, <laughs> there has been a, an array of data sources um, that was used to come up with this model. Um, there was multiple sources and intermediate models combined to create the primary market models and the municipal level adjusted market analysis. Um, so key results, the market analysis model, the addressable market, the cultivation, tourism is an important part when it comes to Vermont, as you know, the consumer and population projection, and then other different um, topics that we had to come up with. So determining the cannabis demand, um, you there are ver there are various consumer categories: the medical, the resident medical patient, the resident adult use consumers, the business and leisure tourism, and the border tourists. Um, and so, having said that, you can see here on the chart what the consumers where they would be um, in various parts of the year. I'm not sure if everybody has access to all the data. I think it's a public document now. Okay, so the process that was used to determine the cannabis demand, um, we utilized the Vermont County and Municipal Level Populations projections from the Vermont Center of Geographic Information. Um, we overlaid the state and subset past month and past year cannabis use frequency data from the Federal National Survey on Drug Use and Health administered by SAMHSA. We analyzed the seasonal tourism data from the Vermont Agency of Community, Commerce and Community Development to evaluate non-Vermont resident cannabis consuming tourists on a seasonal basis. Um, 
So once that happened, we integrated the seasonal demand trends from existing cannabis markets in places like Colorado, Oregon, and Washington to show month-to-month -month shifts in consumer spending. Um, the calculation was done on cannabis expenditures by consumer cohort using the NSDUH data for interpass month use frequency in analogies for price per ounce. Um, I know cost is really important when it comes to consumers. And then the projected product category specific market um, using data from the Vermont medical sales and other regulated Northeast cannabis markets. So to evaluate the supply, there's two types of cultivation. There's the indoor light supplemented greenhouses, which, is allow, which allows flowering plants to be harvested all year. Then there's the outdoor and basic greenhouses, which only uses light from the sun. So given the climate we have here in the Northeast, it results in one harvest per year. Uh, the Cannabis Control Board controls when cultivators receive licenses, but not when they complete their construction or harvest their plants. Um, so once the people receive their licenses, depending on what time of year it is, it'll determine whether or not plants can be harvested outside. So the model incorporates a degree of randomness to highlight the complexities of harvest coming to the regulated market at different times of the year. And here you can see the actual graphic modeling the cannabis cultivation. Um, so depending on the time of year and facility, will determine what the product supply would be. Um, cannabis cultivation and supply that is evaluated is based on a yield per square foot of flowering canopy. Uh, the total grams of cannabis harvested from flowering plants divided by the area of flowering plants harvested that's going to be important when you're talking about uh, different tiers and the establishments that people are looking to open. Um, once that happens, cannabis ex is extracted raw for high-end vaporized cartridges or dried and separated into flour and trimmed for use in inhalable and ingest ingestible in topical forms. Uh, cannabis allocated for extraction is first turned into concentrate, but then divided amongst different types of manufactured products. So depending on what type of product you're going to um, manufacture in your facility is really going to depend, is going to determine how much product you're going to have to yield per facility. So here we have the product production um, for retail supply. Um, there's six major, there's six primary product categories. You have cannabis flower, pre-rolls, concentrates, vaporizer pens, edible products, and topical products. So each of these categories will have dozens to hundreds of different retail product varieties. As I said before, depending on what you're going to create will determine the amount of product that you need to produce. And from there, you look at the total supply and demand. So it's evaluated on a product category basis. Um, supply in Vermont will vary based on the total square foot of cultivation um, the month of the year, the harvested that was yielded, the extraction efficacy and efficiency, and also the allocation of oil to manufactured products. So you're going to see over time the, the demand for particular products from the consumers. So as I said, depending on what you're trying to create, what the consumer market is, will determine the total cultivation required. So that assuming approximately 20% of the cultivation comes from outdoor cultivation and only has one harvest per year, Vermont will likely require 400 to 500,000 square feet of flowering canopy, where flowering canopy, canopy typically makes 40 to 60% of a cultivation facility's premises. Um, this table here shows the balance of seasonal supply and demand with a 450,000 square foot benchmark of flowering canopy and then 20% coming from outdoors. Um, well, the seasonal outdoor supply will surpass demand in the fall, inventory can be stored over time to meet those consumer needs in the winter and spring. So depending on what people are looking to open or where the board decides to go with their priority list, you'll begin to see that as time goes on after um, the licenses have started to be allocated. One of the biggest you know, things to consider is indoor versus outdoor cultivation. Obviously, outdoor cultivation produces less total biomass per square foot since the climate up here in the Northeast only allows for one harvest in the fall. 
Um, the harvest come on the market in the fall before the ski season starts and when the demand is actually lowest that we found. But that same 450,000 square foot of cultivation results in summer shortages if 50% of the square feet were allocated for outdoor cultivators. So it's possible to supply the market with a greater percentage of outdoor cultivation, but doing so may result in larger seasonal supply swings and a less stable market for growers. So when you're trying to look at the overall market and what is sustainable, it's important to consider whether you want to prioritize indoor or outdoor cultivation or have a, a balanced approach. Here you can see um, the percentage of canopy harvested with 20% outdoor or 50% outdoor. So here you can see the total projected sales that we that um, Andrew had projected from 2022 going forward to 2026 um, from medical dispensaries, adult use finished products, and then a combined medical and adult use products and the accessories that are sold at retail. So as you can see, the total retail moves upwards of um, 14 million and 12 million dollars versus some of the other um, type accessories, I call them. So having done that and having had all that as the background, we then came to the, the licensing recommendations. And I think that was um, that market analysis is important as we moved forward talking about uh, the licensing type and fee requirements, the statutory requirements, which the board has to consider as they're making these decisions the initial license type recommendations, and then the potential future license types that I believe would be considered by the legislature. So the license and fee recommendations are really designed to have a legal cannabis market that reflects Vermont's culture and embraces the strengths. It's not a cookie cutter model that is just adopted from other states. We really took um, the time to make sure that the market analysis would show that it promoted sustainability, and that you encouraged outdoor cultivation as we talked about early on in the process. So to promote the equitable and accessible industry, there's license types focus on providing access to small cultivators, individuals operating in the legacy market, and individuals from community disproportionately impacted by harmful government policies, including cannabis prohibition. Um, in other communities, these are called the disproportionately impacted areas. The board believes that the initial license type would begin the process of creating an equitable market and that additional license types and tiers, which I believe is going to be addressed in a later report, could further this goal in, in Vermont. So right now the required license types that we have are cultivators, product manufacturers, wholesalers, retailers, testing laboratories, and the integrated market. The board needed to tier the following license types, but may also tier other ones. So cultivators and retailers need to be tiered at this time. Um, they also must recommend state fees to be charged, including application fees, initial annual license fees, and annual renewal fees for each type of establishment. This is the basis for any regulated market. So one thing to, to keep in mind when it comes to the state of Vermont is the re, uh, statutory requirements. Um, in the statutory, the board needs to propose a plan for reducing or eliminating the license fees for individuals from communities that have been disproportionately impacted um, by cannabis prohibition or individuals directly and personally impacted by cannabis prohibition. Then we need to look at the integrated licenses as they're defined and limited in statute to the existing medical businesses. Having said that, integrated licensees face a statutory $50,000 fee to the Cannabis Business Development Fund. Uh, also, you know, definitions are going to be really important as the board moves forward. A small cultivator uh, is defined in the statute as a tier in statute as a cultivator with a plant canopy or space for cultivating plants or breeding stock of not more than 1,000 square feet. So these are the really small cultivators um, that are going to be trying to get into the market. Plant canopy is the square footage dedicated to the live plant production. Um, it doesn't include any part of the building like office space, storage, uh, or the like. It's just literally the rooms where the plants are live. So 
So the initial license type recommendations um, for cultivation, you have seven outdoor tiers, seven indoor tiers, and a mixed tier. For retail, there are two tiers. Manufacturing have two tiers. And then there's a, um, the wholesaler testing laboratory integrated license types. So here you can see the tiers for outdoor and indoor. Um, tier one obviously would be the small cultivator. Up from there, you have two through six. So it's important to note that tier six is designed to fall within the existing land use regulations for cultivation under an acre of land. Um, and they shall not be available initially. I think the indication is that the supply is needed the board will then allow existing cultivators to expand beyond tier six um, or allow applications for a tier seven in the future. This is going to be a step-by-step -step process in Vermont. So the board is looking at one license targeted at small businesses and farmers so that it allows indoor and outdoor cultivation under one license. I think the important thing to understand is that um, you have people that are looking to get in, in in a small way, not necessarily have a tier five level or higher. So it would allow the license holder to have indoor cultivation space of up to a thousand square feet and grow 50 plants outdoors at the same license premises. Um, this is a way that you can prioritize outdoor cultivation, but then also allow for product manufacturing throughout the year. The licensees that have the flexibility to grow how they choose and the ability to continue cultivation during the winter. So the licensed tiers for retail, you have the storefront, which people can, can recognize as the storefront um, of any business, but then also the nursery. So it enables the licensee to sell seeds and clothes to home cultivators or other licensees. This could be a standalone business. It could be held by an existing nursery or other business. Um, but all the other regulatory requirements need to be met for someone seeking this tier of license in retail. For manufacturing, um, the tier one allows someone to process and manufacture um, cannabis in order to produce the cannabis products, uh, including extraction, solvents, and including solvent-based extraction but the products could be sold to retailers and other licensees, but not directly to consumers. Whereas the manufacturing tier two allows them to manufacture cannabis products like the tier one, but they would be prohibited from using the dangerous solvents such as CO2 in the extractions. This is more of a lower cost license um, that wanted to make infused or processed products and licensees may purchase extracts from infusing from other licensees. For the other license types, um, the integrated obviously is the existing medical businesses as defined in the statute. Wholesale allows a licensee to purchase cannabis products from the licensee to sell to other licensees, but not directly to consumers. And then the test and laboratory is there to allow the licensee to test cannabis and the products from other licensees or from any home cultivator in the state, which I think is important because when you're talking about safety of the product, Testing is a really important part of that for consumer health. Under the statute, future license types need to be considered. And so in addition to what we had proposed, um, we want to make sure that there's room to build the cannabis industry in Vermont in a way that really stays true to the culture of the state and prioritizing outdoor, um, outdoor growth. So these other license types need to um, add additional regulatory requirements or they can need legislative authorization. Uh, the board will provide the legislature more information in 2022, but it's important to highlight them now because as this industry continues to evolve, some of these decisions are going to have to be made. Uh, at this time, I believe the board's discussing the license types, but is not recommending all of them um, at quite yet. We have some available that we've talked about over the past couple months. The co-op cultivation, two different tiers of retail, manufacturing, delivery, on-site consumption, um, temporary events, and then entry level or reduced rate retail. So these types of licenses will be considered going forward, could be considered going forward. One of the most 
um, talked about pieces of this is the fee recommendation what the application fees are going to be, the license fees, what a social equity fee reduction could be, and the, the fee proposal by the board. One of the backbones, of, I believe, of this statute, of the one that, um, and actually one that we've considered time and again, is that the statute requires the board to propose fees that are going to cover the agency's operating costs as well as repay any appropriations that have been received. That is an important piece to remember because as the board is talking about the fee structure and just how much they're going to, to really charge in fees, it all kind of pinpoints back down to it has to cover the operating costs. So especially when we talk about social equity, if there's any weight fees or there's any lower fees, that has to be made up in other places. Um, Covering all the costs um, is, like I said, a significant outlier. And when compared to the cannabis license fees around the country and regulatory fees in the state, we tried to really look at what is already being charged in the state for different industries and stay consistent with that. So the board has to decide, and this is really an important piece of this, there are two separate fee proposals. And so we have to really take a look at what those fee proposals are and what the ultimate outcome is. Um, and I'll leave this up for a second. So for proposal A, um, which is the one that would cover the costs and provide enough revenue to reimburse the state, the size of the fees would keep prospective entrepreneurs out of the market and would make Vermont an outlier when compared to most competitor states. Proposal B was designed to balance the goals of generating significant fee revenue but providing low cost entry into the market for many of these license types and keeping the fees most competitive with nearby states in other markets without limited licenses. So in this case, some tax revenue would need to cover operating expenses, but this investment is going to help Vermont ensure that it has a functioning and inclusive market. Um, so just as I said before, if you're going to waive or reduce fees in some areas, there's going to have to be places that these are made up. So under the application fee recommendations, there's really, we're looking at a two-part licensing process. So potential applicants can file an intent to apply early in the process. And that will allow the applicant to meet background checks and any other application requirements the board deems necessary before procuring real estate and finalizing business plans. This is an important piece because one of the things that we realized in Massachusetts is that people were paying rent on businesses long before they were even able to apply for a license. And so if the applicant in this instance submits an intent to apply, the application fee will be reduced by the amount already paid through the intent. Um, this will give the board an early sense of the demand in order to gauge the supply. It allows applicants to get state approval for their leadership team and their initial plans before having to procure real estate. It allows applicants to begin the process before finalizing the details of their plan. It allows the state to collect a portion of the application fee earlier in the process. And it also provides entrepreneurs a relatively low cost first step they can use to evaluate the vi viability of their plan. You want to make sure that the people applying for licenses are going to, able to be able to stay open. I think one of the most successful pieces of any legalized industry is that they're open for longer than three years. And so this will give an entrepreneur time to think about all of that as they plan. So the license fee recommendation, um, remembering that proposal A covers the cost and proposal B is a balance. Um, these are the fee recommendations from tiers one to six and also the mixed tier. I will, we will look at the indoor cultivation license fees. So you can see the difference in the, uh, the level of fees that would be paid through the different proposals. But remember, keep in mind, proposal A, you know, well, to some it may look high, it needs to cover the cost, the operating costs of the board. Here are the retail license fees.
in the manufacturing license piece. So the last slide is the integrated wholesaler testing labs and employee registration fees. So for the employee registration fees and the local processing fees, um, the board recommended that the municipalities either be permitted to set their own fee, which should be capped at $100, or be required to follow the uniform charges set in statute in Vermont. And so really we don't see a large number of activity or a lot of work that's going to be, have to be done at the municipal level to process the paperwork that would be required for a cannabis license, but that's for each municipality to determine on their own. So one of the um, most important of any legalization bill is social equity. And uh, for the social equity fee, there are reduction recommendations. One is that application fees should be waived and that license fees should be waived in the first year, but then reduced by 75, 50, and 25% respectively in the next three years. And that licensees must demonstrate a financial need and then show plans for remedying the situation moving forward. So there is going to be documentation that social equity applicants would have to prove their financial need. So the board proposal recommendation is that it strongly recommends that the legislature choose and adopt proposal B, which is the lower fee schedule. Um, an adult use market can develop correctly and inclusively, but it will generate significant tax revenues. Most other legalized states use the resident revenue to cover costs for the cannabis regulatory agency. There's not usually an outlying um, number in the budget that has to cover that. And then some use the revenue to lessen the burden on licensees in Vermont um, who will benefit cannabis consumers and potential small operators. The lower fees will encourage more applications and licenses. licenses. Proposed B will close the projected revenue gap by encouraging the number of licenses to end up closer to the more de robust rather than the dynamic. And then potential future licenses uh, type should bring in additional revenue, making the projected revenue gap even greater. So uh, Jen, is that a good place to pause for discussion? Sure. So um, yeah, advisory committee, I don't want to dominate here, uh, but I would like to stop here and, and solicit your input on this. Um, Tim, I know you want to talk about local fees, but I would just put a pin in that for right now and just ask the advisory committee, um, you know, some of the points, takeaways that, that I have here are, you know, the models project 20% indoor versus, or sorry, 80% indoor, 20% outdoor does that seem about right to folks uh, i want to hear um have we done enough to encourage outdoor cultivation which is critical to our mission um and um do the tier do the tiering and fees look about right and um i think those are some good starting points i don't know if anyone has any comments on any of this and then we'll move to local fees tim I think the indoor outdoor ratio is about right or you know, a good place to start. Great. Stephanie? Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that we're talking about fees obviously for the cannabis for getting into the market and being a cannabis control board. Um, but there's potentially other fees that individuals are going to have to pay. I mean, not to go into the local fee conversation right now, but there's zoning permits and so on and so forth. Um, or, uh, I don't know, you know, fire safety reviews. Um, and, and I feel like those fees should be acknowledged so that, you know, just as a footnote somewhere, um, that this is not all that you know, lots of other things <laughs> apply. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Anyone else want to comment on the just the general fee structure and kind of what we were thinking? Just 
You know, in Proposal A, um, the difference between the indoor versus outdoor, you know, just we threw out an estimation of about one to four in co in fees. So, like, you know, the lowest fee, uh, the lowest tier is a thousand dollars in Proposal A. The, in in for outdoor, for indoor, we made it four thousand. Just recognizing that there's about a potentially of between four and six uh, turnover in indoor crops. So, you know, we tried to equalize that a little bit with the fee structure. Um, if there's nothing else, Tim, you know, I know you, you sent a, an email um, about local fees and feel free to take the floor. Is there more local fees? Well, I don't want to take the floor, really. I, I sent that email to kind of get everything out there and I knew that you had a one hour meeting to, to uh, squeeze in a lot of information. Um, just to summarize, obviously, I just I feel that the needs and uh, costs and risks to local municipalities need to be considered. Um, and it goes a little bit beyond, you know, what you can quantify. Um, my email went into a little bit of detail what you can't quantify and what you can't quantify is honestly what some, many, uh, at least some municipalities will be looking at as they make decisions whether to opt in, if that continues to be the, the way the legislature wants communities to, um, to become participants. So I think uh, the board would do well to keep a close eye on the rate of, uh, of signals that municipalities are giving interest in being part of the marketplace. And, you know, I think um, that might be affected by what's moving forward through the legislature. Um, and I just wanted to, I actually had a question about the proposals and it's probably something that just didn't occur to me uh, earlier on, but I was just curious about the proposal A and proposal B. Um, is it, am I correct in understanding that proposal A pretty much assures a self-contained um, marketplace that that's, is self-supporting um, and proposal B does need some tax revenue support from general fund. That, that's right. It, I guess uh, my question is, was there ever an A minus or a B plus? Why is it just two choices that you decided to look at? Did you look at any kind of median between those two examples? So I think you know how we got to A, which is we, we have a projected budget and we just kind of looked at the dynamic of how many people might participate and tried to estimate what the license types or the fees needed to be. B was really set to balance um, our fees with our with our competitor states essentially, you know, so that people that are looking at the market in Vermont versus Massachusetts or potentially New York aren't going to say, well, I'd rather just cultivate in New York. It's a larger market. The fees are less. So it's uh, it's really an attempt to kind of keep us at least in some balance with our neighbors. So there, it's and also, you know, we're providing this to the legislature and, and providing them with a menu of options. They have the ultimate say on the on these fees, and so if they want to do something totally different, they're they're able to do that. Um, but that was the kind of two the two th thinking. And then of course, if if we go with proposal A, you know, and our fees are um, much higher than our neighboring states and, and just more barriers to entry, you know, there's a dynamic that was kind of in the market analysis that says that much many Many fewer people were at, will actually participate, which kind of cuts against one of our core principles, which is trying to shift the unregulated market into a regulated space. Okay. Um, thank you. That makes sense. Uh, I don't think I have too much more to say. I think I've said a lot in the, uh, in the email. If anybody is out there listening and wants a copy and didn't get one because I don't have staff. I just sort of tried to grab all of the emails that I that I had. Um, I can share that with anybody who's interested. Um, and um, 
Yeah, there was some, uh, a new piece of information on the slides. I noticed that um, addressing in my, you know, in my in my commentary, I addressed the two um, reasons of a municipality might hesitate. Um, the first being just the practical, measurable work of the of the uh, getting the licenses going and checking in with people and the work of people who serve like me on select boards and dealing with uh, locals having concerns and complaints and zoning issues and things like that, um, that the um, that the proposal to apply the, uh, what's it called, the uniform? Uniform charge schedule, I think, or fee schedule. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, uniform fee schedule. Keep forgetting the term for that. Um, that does go some way to alleviate some of my concerns on the, on the application of the paperwork side, um, but not too much on the other side of my concerns. My only comment. Thanks, Tim. And you know, I will acknowledge that the main kind of sticking point between the House and the Senate uh, when they were considering the, the costs that municipalities would incur was whether they should have a participate in kind of the benefit of the excise tax or um, or whether they should have a fee supported system and in the end the fee supported system was the way that the legislature went but I can tell you if there's not a lot of towns that are participating that th that conversation might open again I would agree that's sort of what I'm hoping for yeah. uh, it's because it's absolutely a reasonable conversation and I know it's not really the purview of your board to uh, tell the legislature that they should reconsider but um, I think showing some good evidence that this might be the way to go if we're gonna get some good partnerships going um, it's a good thing to suggest so thank you yeah. Jen, is there anything else in this section that you feel like we should review before? I want to save time to review the social equity criteria. And I see that you know we have about seven minutes before we have public, we're supposed to open a public comment. I don't, I really think that um, it's just the justification for the, um, the revenue, it's the, it's the fee revenue projections. Um, when this becomes public, everyone will be able to see what exactly is in the um, in the proposal? So okay. we don't have to go over all of that. Um, and then there's just the local fee recommendations, which we've talked about. Okay. Great. Well, um, I think then we should shift gears to social equity, which is the other piece of the report that we have to submit by Friday. So I think um, I don't know. Is was Gina going to review that or Bryn? I think yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Gina. Hi, yeah. Uh, I will try. There she'll, stare, there she'll share in my screen. Okay. So we went over a lot of social equity, you know, what that candidate would look like, what they would need to show for their application, you know, what the criteria was in our last meeting. Um, so I'll just continue from the work that we've done since then. Um, one of the major things that we discussed last time was revising the definition to family. Um, C. Bond recommended that last time, and so we did that. We included domestic partner, um, and that was approved by the subcommittee board. As Jen has stated about, and what we discussed last time about reduced application fees and licensing uh, fee waivers. Um, and then we, what we didn't discuss last time was the other fees that were recommended, um, which Jen also has discussed, which is probationary licensing fee. So I um, would like to apply, um, we wanted that way, employee registration fees to be paid by businesses, which is done with the medicinal right now. 
and then local fees would be waived, but only for the first year. And you know, this is just for some information as why we made this recommendation is that the startup costs are the most expensive and we wanted the most cost saving in the beginning and um, reduce as people are able to gain revenue. And then we discuss about a social equity licensing business transfer. So if a company will transfer to another social equity licensee, we said that would there start off with the second year, which is that 75% off a licensing fee. Um, however, if the partnership was transferred to one of the business partners or a family member, they would have to take over whatever the current owner's um, fee schedule is. So if they are um, coming up on the fourth year, then um, that company remains the same and that this was in order to prevent people to continuously restarting um, new fee structures. Also, if there was a transfer within the first five years, to a non-social equity licensee, the new licensee business owner had to repay any cost savings the company received from the social equity beneficiary program. Now the reason for this was we wanted to prevent um, people from starting up social equity companies and then just handing them over to other people um, that were non-social equity candidates in order to save money. Um, also, the person, the new owner would not be entitled to those benefits, um, so it needed to be repaid back. After five years, ownership, transfer of ownership is allowed without penalty as they would not be receiving any more benefits at that time. Um, one of the things that we really wanted to state that the social equity benefits are not only open to a licensee holder, but to anyone who would be able to, um, that would be a social equity candidate. So that we have really two separate tracks here. You know, you can still get the education benefits that we would like, um, cannabis certificate courses, um, training workshops that would be available. Uh, for any entry into the business. This, this is to ensure and to um, have multiple social equity and really create an inclusive and diverse industry. Um, we need people at all different levels in the industry and social equity candidates may need that additional education and other support. Um, if you are a licensee holder, you would get priority licensing and processing, but also the deduction, as we said, um, with licensing fees. Um, we will think about access to low interest loans through banks, and we have um, made a recommendation to open exclusive licenses. One would be a co-op, and another would be a delivery. The time limits of exclusivity would be determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. So for the delivery license, we recommended that it be set up as a social equity candidate is hired by a retail business as an employee that the retailer has to provide the vehicles, the insurance coverage for the driver and car. Um, a customer would call in or submit an order online and then the delivery licensee holder who is the social equity um, licensee holder is the only one who can um, deliver product to customers. Also one of the things was stated that you can, a delivery driver cannot store marijuana or marijuana products overnight. So everything needs to be returned to the retailer. For a co-op licensee, we were thinking because there were such limited funds in the business development um, funds right now, we wanted to unite and pull the money together in order um, to purchase land and equipment because that is always the number one most burdensome for a social equity candidate to be able to be successful in the industry and then have like a seed to sell system so they um, provide, um, be a cultivator, a processor, um, 
be able to be a retail store um, through the whole thing, and then social equity candidates can maybe pay a monthly fee to support this program. As we said, because there's only 500,000 right now that is allocated, that we needed to um, look for alternative ways to get loans and grants, um, which is you know trying to create partnership with banks and trying to get that through them at this time into we had more revenue. Um, one of the ways that we were thinking of creating more revenue was to create a cannabis trust fund um, so that the public can donate to this program and also that at least 5% of cannabis tax revenue goes to support the social equity program. And that should be always monitored every six months to really see what the cost um, that the program is incurring. Great, thank, thank you, Gina. Hope discussions for next time. <laughs> great, yeah, and so just, um, this is great work and obviously it's ongoing work. Um, just for Friday, um, you know, all we are reporting back on to the legislature are the specific criteria for eligibility for social equity um, and not the benefits and privileges, but just for the sake of the advisory committee. Um, I would say that the, the board voted to eliminate opportunity zones from that criteria. Um, and the thinking was, you know, the social equity is defined by the statute as people who um, come from historically disproportionately impacted areas as well as um, people who have been personally um, uh, impacted by cannabis prohibition. And so we thought that based on the other two criteria that we did approve, person of color or someone who's been, um, uh, has a cannabis related offense, conviction, or lives with a household member who has one, that um, there was nothing in adding that kind of opportunity zone that wasn't already covered um, when you think about the statutory definition of social equity. And so um, that was our kind of justification for that. And um, I'd like to open that conversation up briefly um, to the advisory committee, if there's any thoughts or concerns or, or input that they would like to provide us before we move to public comment. And just as a, I see you got H414 up there, I think that that opportunity zones are an important piece of when we think about community reinvestment and using some of the cannabis revenue, but I just don't think that, um, you know, when you look at criteria two and three on that screen, that, um, that they add anything to um, the statutory definition of social equity applicant. That was a decision by the board. So um, again, I'd open it up to um, members of the advisory committee if they'd like to comment. I think we might just open it up to public comment if, if no one has any questions about the um, taking off opportunity zones. All right. Well, advisory committee, thank you again for all the incredible work you've done. I know that this is not the end of our journey together, but this is kind of a shift um, in um, in our process and um, you know we will be in touch you know feel again you know you are still our kind of closest advisors on all of these issues even after the subcommittees wind down um, and our goal is to kind of convene you before our major milestones we do have a report due on November 1st um, that report is related to concentrates and um, uh, converting CBD to Delta 9 THC and also on the medical for or marijuana for symptom relief oversight committee reorganization. I've reached out to our exploratory committee to convene them next week. If anyone would like to join that, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, but I don't think that we need to reconvene the full advisory committee before we submit that report. Um, but again, if anyone would like to participate in those discussions, please reach out to me. Um, other than that, um, I say we should open to public comment. Um, if you'd like, if you're a member of the public um, and you joined through the link, 
please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to make a public comment. We have uh, Ben Mervis. Ben? Hi everyone, uh, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, you are seen for all this work and appreciate it. And we particularly appreciate the inclusion of social consumption or on-site consumption uh, in the things to be revisited. So thank you very much. And thank you to the subcommittee members. Thanks, Ben. Anyone else for public comment? Okay. Nope. Great. No one's, no one's joined by phone either. So. Okay. All right. Well, I've been advised once again that we don't actually have to uh, call a motion to adjourn. That um, I can just adjourn the meeting. So, if there's no one else that would like to comment from the advisory committee or from the public, um, I will adjourn the meeting of the advisory committee. Just one quick question, James. Sure. Uh, Chris Walsh. Um, how is it? Are the slides that Jen and Gina presented available, or is there a way we can access them? like to go over them today? Yeah, we'll get them up on our website for the members of the public and we'll email them to the advisory committee separately. Great, Chris, thank you. I'm um, adding to the chat right now uh, on here. Um, I've also supported to Nelly as well. Okay, all right, great. Thank you, Gina. Great, anything else? Okay. I'll call this but meeting adjourned. You should be able to see it in the chat now. Um, so thank you. Yeah.